Right, I think we can start now. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to um, College of Physician Weekly Webinars. I'm Dr. Mina, I'm from Taiping Hospital. Um, so this month, we'll be starting off with um, COVID-19 only exclusive topics. So usually we have um, uh, sub-specialities, but this month we decided to um, talk about only COVID-19. So we'll start off with um, updates in management uh, of COVID-19. We have, um, we had, uh, the, the CPG was updated recently. And so um, we'll talk about that today. And uh, very grateful to have Prof. Dr. Adiba today from University of Malaya. She requires no further introduction, I believe. And so with that, Prof, it's all yours. Thanks very much, Mina. Salam alaikum and good afternoon, everyone. Um, um, we, we're very delighted to kick off the um, October weekly webinar with uh, today's presentation on the updates and management of COVID-19 by Dr. Nor Arisa, who has had um, possibly, along with the team at um, Sungai Buloh, uh, country's largest experience in managing COVID-19. So I can't think of a better person to um, give us today an update on management of COVID-19. Um, it is a dizzying sort of topic because um, things seem to change um, a lot based on um, results of either clinical trials or observational studies. Um, and it's re it really behooves us to um, you know, keep up to date with uh, the latest in management. Alhamdulillah, we're seeing um, a reduction in the number of cases. And I think most of us are starting to breathe. Uh, Mina just told me that they're starting to uh, close down the, the beds at uh, COVID beds at Taiping. We're doing the same at UMMC, but I think um, Arisa and team probably um, have to bertahan a bit longer um, as the main admitting hospital in the country or at least in um, Klan Valley. So with that, um, as I said, it gives me great pleasure to um, introduce Arisa, who um, did her master's in medical uh, in, in, in medicine at uh, UM and then went on to train in infectious disease uh, at the Ministry of Health. So over to you, Arisa. Thank you, Prof Adiba for the kind introduction. Hello, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, let me just share my slides. Okay, so um, thank you uh, Academy of Medicine for inviting me to give this talk. It's a huge um, topic to cover. So I'll try my best um, to compress everything uh, in half an hour, 45 minutes um, and followed by a Q&A sessions. Um, it's a mixture of basic as well as a little bit of details on management of COVID-19 and some um, case um, uh, sharing uh, to illustrate on how to manage uh, cases and how to use certain drugs that we used. Uh, um, and I hope that if, you, if you, any of you would like to ask anything, could uh, just drop the question in the chat box or during the Q&A sessions later. Okay, just a reminder, uh, before we kick off, um, COVID-19 um, disease um, is this spectrum of uh, disease whereby patient can come in early or late. So we usually divide uh, them according to whether they come in during the viral phase or, or as early as uh, less than seven days, uh, where at this point they are usually very infectious. Uh, whether they come in with uh, mild symptoms or some of them were asymptomatic uh, and we label them as category one and category two, followed by stage two or the pulmonary phase where they started to have um, pulmonary infiltrates, uh, more presentation on cough, uh, breathlessness, and usually will require admission, followed by um, the 
hyperinflammatory phase where they will require higher oxygen requirement and the increase of host inflammatory response uh, needing treatment. So um, why COVID-19 is such a big deal? Um, we thought that initially that the disease is very mild, self-limiting, but um, based on this uh, sample that we did in Sungai Bulu back in 2020, February to May, when uh, we were first hit during the first wave or no, second wave, um, uh, we, we found that about 6% of patients actually progressed to develop severe disease and some die despite intervention and ICU care. So it is very important for us to understand the disease, um, track through the progression of disease and try to halt the progression and treat the patient accordingly. So we try to stratify our patients according to their age, their comorbidities. There are some studies and meta-analysis looking at uh, any uh, risk factors that could predict uh, progression of disease. So patients who have comorbidities, um, obesity, pregnancy or recent pregnancy, um, underlying immunocompromised patients such as malignancy or HIV, they are more um, likely to progress. So these patients should be managed in the either low risk uh, centers for close monitoring or transferred to a uh, tertiary hospital for management. And why do we want to look at the projection? So um, in terms of infectious disease, we learned this during management of dengue, where we look at the point when the patient actually goes downhill. So similar to COVID, when they first came in, they come in with pyramid phase. And as the virus came down, you, you in some patients, we will start to see uh, the rise in inflammatory markers. And this is the time when we should do intervention. Um, as um, late presenters um, who came in late, uh, stayed at home for home quarantine, for example, and when they come in later on to off-tech themselves at um, PKD or CAC and found to be hypoxic, they come in late and we can only offer salvage therapy in terms of drugs and ICU care. So, Internationally, there are many guidelines uh, promoting or um, outlining the treatment of COVID-19 based on the severity. So whether they are hospitalized, on oxygen, not on oxygen, or they are in ICUs. So similarly for Malaysia, our latest um, updated um, CPG was uh, out in August. But um, for the interest of this talk, I would like to com compartmentalize um, the issues uh, that we physician needs to pick up uh, and um, try to uh, arrest the progression of COVID because these are the four main factors why patients with COVID-19 deteriorated. So first, we'll talk about patients who come in with viral pneumonia phenotype. So they usually come in very early, less than seven days. They still exhibiting early viral um, symptoms such as fever, upper respiratory tract infection, symptoms like sore throat, cough, um, or diarrhea. Their inflammatory markers are usually very low with low NLR ratio. Um, chest x-ray just showed normal or minimal ground glass. Um, at this point of time, we do not really have a good effective antiviral that's shown to halt progression to severe disease. I'll talk about the some of the antivirals that has been used um, for this uh, part uh, of the COVID. And um, we also try not to use immunomodulators during the viral phase as this has been shown to prolong viral shed and cause more harm to the patient. So I'll just share the first case uh, with all of you. We have a 49 years old gentleman who came in early, less than seven days, with uh, progressive uh, shortness of breath and cough two days prior to presentation. So when he came in, he was having shortness of breath, cough, 
and needing oxygen with um, room air saturation of only 92%. However, if we look at the blood parameters, they are all very low. So we call this hypoinflammatory hypoxia um, with low D-dimer, not suggestive of any pulmonary embolism and uh, white cell count showing um, uh, viral-like uh, uh, presentation. So the X-ray also shows uh, ground uh, glass uh, infiltrates bilaterally. So what we did, um, we started favipiravir. So this was back in December 2020. Um, so you could see this, the trend of CRP, um, our value is uh, milligram per deciliter. So if you convert it, it will be 28. So it ranges less than 50. Low ferritin, low NLR ratio. And we started him on uh, antiviral uh, with a dose of interferon because at that time we, will, we were still practicing using interferon. Um, no steroid was started despite patient being on oxygen and the patient remained well and discharged without the need of steroids. So there, are, there were many uh, papers published regarding the repurpose of antiviral drugs for COVID-19, but this uh, showed that remdesivir, hydroxychloroquine, lopinavir, interferon, some of the drugs that are familiar to some of us or most of us, has little or no effect on hospitalized patients with COVID-19, as indicated by mortality, initiation of ventilation, and duration of hospital stay. So there, there's um, already work going on uh, on the uh, next uh, project of Solidarity Plus to look at repurposing drugs such as artisunate, infliximab, and imatinib uh, in as uh, an antiviral of choice for COVID-19. And this will be something interesting for us to look at in the future. So I'll talk a little bit on ivermectin. It's a very controversial drug. The yes of ivermectin. So there are papers showing that um, there's if efficacy and safety uh, data on ivermectin. However, there are also papers mentioning about the nose of using ivermectin. Um, and uh, because of this very low to low certainty ev uh, evidence that we found in all the papers that has, has been published, uh, we uh, advocate to not use ivermectin outside clinical trial. And in Malaysia, we have our own ivermectin treatment efficacy trial that is going on. And I believe many centers, including uh, Sungai Bulo, are now in the process of recruitment. And we hope to hear uh, the outcome of the results before the end of the year. How about remdesivir? So we do have experience using remdesivir in Malaysia. It is an IV formulation of antiviral drug that can or may be used early in the disease for those who require oxygen. So for those who were on remdesivir based on ACTT trial, um, showed that remdesivir patient fare better, um, but it has to be used early. So, in the latest guideline, we mentioned the use of remdesivir for category four patients, which uh, has pneumonia on oxygen, uh, plus the use of low dose steroid. Uh, but if in patients who steroids uh, is contraindicated, we can actually use remdesivir together with an alternative immunomodulator, which I'll talk about a bit later. But Remdesivir has its disadvantages. So it is an IV drug. So patient needs to be inpatient um, and they do develop some side effects. So we have seen um, many patients developing uh, hepatitis. Some were developing coagulopathy um, and it, it's also quite thrombo uh, phlebitic agent. Uh, so patients develop very bad uh, thrombo um, uh, when they receive IV uh, remdesivir. Um, and many patients, especially in our local setting, came in a bit later because they use they are usually quarantined at home. So when they come in late, the use of IV remdesivir is a bit uh, 
uh, controversial. Um, and there are more uh, role of steroids plus minus immunomodulator in them. So oral antiviral is actually hopefully the future that we want to look at. So there are many papers, many investigators out there trying hard to, to look at what um, oral antivirals that will be effective. So looking for the magic bullet, um, ideally oral, okay. Um, so we have looked at trying to use hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine. Uh, we tried to repurpose um, antiretroviral protease inhibitors such as Caletra uh, and Flavipiravir that we also have used before, but it is not rarely uh, recommended with low evidence uh, of um, help in COVID uh, and halting the progression. So Remdesivir has roles in early CAT4 disease, as I mentioned. Ivermectin, many studies not favoring its use. Um, some of the studies were poorly done, sample size was small, and some cherry picking results. And hopefully, we shall wait for our ITEC study, Ivermectin Malaysia, and also the principal study in UK with ongoing recruitment. I think about a week ago, um, we, uh, uh, we have uh, been um, hearing about the use of molnupiravir. Um, so this is an oral direct anti -retro, uh, antiviral agent so for COVID-19. It has been used before for influenza. Uh, it causes error in the virus replication and in this mutation downstream leading to reduction in the um, viral activity, especially in the nasopharyngeal uh, region. So it has gone through phase two, phase three trial. They had these two papers uh, move in and move out, um, looking at the use as inpatient and outpatient uh, for oral antiviral uh, agent. But the move in, which is the inpatient study, does not look at does does not demonstrate any clinical benefit and has been terminated early. While the move out uh, interim data showed. Uh, very promising results uh, in re reduction of risk uh, of hospitalization or death by 50%. But I will say it is still too early. Um, one interesting thing that I just found that this drug Molnupiravir was named after Thor's hammer, Molnur, uh, which is thought to be the magic bullet or magic hammer that can strike the virus and um, uh, stop the progression. So we shall see whether it is uh, it will be the future of our COVID treatment as our patient. Um, a, a bit on monoclonal antibodies. Um, so this is a passive antibody transfusion of anti-SARS-CoV-2 antibodies. So this is uh, produced in the lab. FDA has approved um, the emergency use or authority for non-hospitalized uh, mild to moderate COVID patients in US uh, for um, patients who may progress um, to severe disease. So three drugs, uh, three um, uh, types of uh, monoclonal antibodies has been approved. One of it um, that we are thinking of bringing to uh, our local shores is Regen Cough. Um, however, it is a very short uh, lived um, passive antibody, meaning that uh, it helps to neutralize the um, viral activity, but it does not provide the host with a long lasting immunity. So patient will still need to be vaccinated. Um, so it may be suitable for patients who um, are severely immunocompromised, but unfortunately it is very expensive and um, as I say, it is not available yet in Malaysia. So the next uh, um, bits uh, that uh, is commonly being mentioned in uh, COVID-19 management is about cytokine release um, syndrome, so um, or CRS. It's the most common cause of deterioration. Uh, we fear for this uh, CRS event, and we um, closely monitor patients and looking for clues if they go into CRS so that we can uh, treat them fast. Um, there are roles of immunomodulators. Um, as this is an 
active uh, systemic inflammatory response. So the body's immune system just go haywire, producing a lot of pro-inflammatory cytokines, for example, IL-6. And this IL-6 causes a lot of damage by causing vascular permeability, alveoli damage, ARDS, and multi-organ failure. However, in, in trying to um, reduce the hyperinflammatory phase, we also need to balance and not render the patient too towards the immunosuppressive parts. So trying to get this balance between trying to control the inflammatory part, but not rendering them um, immunosuppressive and not able to combat secondary infections. So th this is very important hemostasis that we need to achieve and think during CRS and um, uh, trying to uh, keep, target the treatment. So this is our Sungai Bulo data. It's not published, uh, but roughly about 50% patients um, actually responded to steroids. So we collected data um, and we look at the uh, response when we use DEXA only. Uh, we found that about 50% actually responded to DEXA, but some actually needed um, escalation of steroids uh, plus minus other immunomodulators. So I share an example of how we use steroids. Uh, this is a 50 years old man with underlying diabetes, came in at one week of illness uh, with positive PCR tests, was tachycardi and tachypneic in a low-risk quarantine center, was given IV dexamethasone in the center and was sent to Sungai Buloh. Uh, unfortunately, at day nine of illness, while in the ward, um, he progresses and require a higher oxygen requirement at face mask 10. So when we look at the inflammatory markers, the white cell is 10, 9, and 12. Uh, look at the CRP, was, um, if we convert, it will be 117, 180, and 182. So he progressed despite receiving two days of DEXA 12. So what is the usual or the, the, the response to uh, a patient who progressed despite dexamethasone uh, use? So the treatment was escalated to IV methylprednisolone to mg per kg. Uh, and he received uh, methylprednisolone for three days. At this point, we do not have um, uh, that many immunomodulators available in Sungai Bulo. So most of the time, patient will need um, higher steroid dosing. Um, and um, true enough, after three days of methylprednisolone, the CRP uh, came down, oxygen requirement improved, and he was switched to oral dexamethasone and was discharged well. This uh, were his uh, chest x-ray before uh, methylprednisolone and after methylprednisolone with other blood parameters looking fine. So in principles, um, steroid use based on recovery trial, well-coded trial is dexamethasone 6 milligram. However, in Malaysia, because our dose of dexamethasone, we recommend 8 to 12 milligram daily because of the dexa base in the IV dexamethasone that we use in Malaysia. So for those who have higher BMI more than 30, we advocate using 12 milligram. And if they, they are, do not respond to DEXA or we call DEXA failure, uh, we recommend stepping up to IV methylprednisolone 2 mg per kilo. Uh, if we have um, comfortably excluded bacteria infection as the cause of CRP rise, if the patient requires higher oxygen, so even if the CRP is high by oxygen saturation is well, we try to stick with the lowest steroid possible. And um, we also need to quickly step down the patient back to dexamethasone 8 to 12 milligram once clinical and CRP response are good, as I illustrated in the case before, at least about 50% reduction of CRP from the highest peak, or if we use a second agent such as Tosi or Bari. And we oralize uh, steroids to 
uh, to dexamethasone as soon as the patient is able to tolerate uh, orally because IV and oral bioavailability is similar. And please try not to use dexamethasone higher than 12 milligram unless uh, any of you have methylprednisolone stop issue um, in your hospital. So, Unfortunately, if we are trigger happy by giving everybody steroids, we really have to think about the um, collateral damage that we will cause by doing that. So steroids is non-specific. So it inhibits a lot of pathway in our immune system. So yes, it helps to control CRS. Unfortunately, it also render the host immunocompromised. So excessive usage of steroids is actually very harmful um, and it increases the risk of nosocomial infection or bacterial infection and uh, even worse uh, fungal infection. So um, in terms of CRS management, it has evolved from the first uh, time we managed COVID last year where we use a lot of steroids um, but now we have moved to using short duration lower steroid dosing combined with second agent in severe disease. So let's talk about second agent in CRS. So it, it has to be used early, uh, less than two weeks of illness, when the patient has evidence of uh, CRS with high CRP or other inflammatory markers such as ferritin, um, LDH, uh, or in some centers, if you can do IL-6 level, patients are not on any other immunomodulators. There are no or low evidence of ongoing bacterial infection. So if procalcitonin can be done, it is low. Uh, it has to be used in combination with uh, low-dose steroids or low-dose methylprednisolone. And patient who are uh, we consider who we consider to use second agent should be in the opinion of physician were less likely to die uh, or inevitably die in the next 24 hours or if they are do not resuscitate we should also try to exclude because it is very expensive drug and it's very limited so we try to use it for those who really will benefit it so the first um, uh, immunomodulators I'll talk about is IL-6 receptor inhibitor, which is IV tocilizumab. The usual dose, uh, the recommended dose is 8 mg per kilogram IV formulation together with a combination of steroid of choice. Um, bear in mind, tocilizumab takes about 48 to 72 hours to work in reducing the inflammatory markers. So is, it, it's an uh, IL-6 uh, inhibitor why IL-6 uh, is important uh, because it causes a lot of um, uh, damage in the lung, in the muscle, it causes high troponins, it leads to ARDS, it, it causes um, hepatitis, it reduces the human albumin uh, production in the body, it causes fever, uh, it induces ACS and um, multi-organ failure. So it is a very uh, important uh, pro-inflammatory markers uh, that uh, has been well uh, studied in COVID. So I'll share a case on how to use tocilizumab. This, uh, we had a 49 years old uh, fit army officer. Uh, he's 82 kilos, uh, just with underlying hypertension on single antihypertensive agent, came in from another hospital um, with uh, so-called lowish platelet but negative dengue results. Uh, probably at that time, he was in his viral phase and he had mild AKI, which is, was resolved with uh, hydration. Um, okay, so I'll guide you through this. Um, it started off with from the right hand side, where when he first came in, he was on face mask 5 liters with PO2 of 112. Um, dexamethasone was given and and because of his high uh, requirement of oxygen to face mask, IV methylprednisolone was added. Um, despite uh, receiving IV methylprednisolone for a couple of days, his CRP 
wasn't really down and worst part is his oxygen requirement keep increasing and if you look at the ferritin level it was high to begin with at 2363 and it was still high above 800 uh, despite receiving three doses of uh, methylprednisolone so because of the need of uh, high flow nasal cannula in Venzi ventilation uh, and non-responding to uh, methylprednisolone, IV tocilizumab was added. Uh, and about 48 hours after IV tocilizumab, we could see that the CRP starts to go down from 9.9 .9 to 2.4. I'm sorry that I do not have a, level, uh, a ferritin level here. To, to guide you, but you could also see that the D-dimer is very high, 27K. Uh, and so Tosi was given at that time because he was at the verge of intubation. And because at that time also we were, we had very limited stocks of Tosilizumab. So uh, it is only uh, indicated to be used for patients who were near intubation or near ICU admission. So after 48 hours of tocilizumab, he improved. These are his um, serial chest x-rays. You could see uh, worsening pulmonary infiltrates bilaterally, especially on the left side. And the CTPA was done at day 18 of illness, um, showing uh, changes suggestive of organizing pneumonia, which is common in COVID as well as evidence of pulmonary embolism. So the second um, immunomodulators that I would like to um, comment on is uh, Janus kinase inhibitor, uh, which are baricitinib and tofacitinib, available, both available in Malaysia, but we are more experienced in using baricitinib. Uh, these two are oral drug inhibitors. It uh, inhibits JAK1 and JAK2, uh, and has been repurposed uh, as it used to be used in rheumatology field to treat RA. It modulates the downstream inflammatory response and inhibits dose-dependent inhibition to IL-6-induced uh, STAT-3 phosphorylation. And it, baricitinib also has been postulated to have some antiviral effects in uh, monkeys. So um, what I like about baricitinib um, is that um, if we use um, steroid, high dose steroid alone, um, it causes a lot of collateral damage. But for baricitinib, because it is very specific, it did not cause a reduction in T and B cell lymphocytes. So it just helps to reduce the downstream production of IL-6 and other uh, inflammatory markers, but it did not render the patient lymphopenic. Uh, if used uh, uh, in a uh, duration recommended. So many papers and meta-analysis looking at um, good clinical outcomes in terms of reduction of mortality, favoring drug inhibitor, ICU admission, mechanical ventilation, ARDS, and early discharges in these patients. So how to use um, baricitinib? So we have a patient here with underlying diabetes um, on oral uh, OHA and dyslipidemia. So category four, um, when he came in at day eight of illness requiring high flow mass. But um, unfortunately, when he arrived to our ED, he was uh, requiring uh, assisted ventilation, high flow nasal cannula. And um, he, despite receiving antibiotics, cultures negative and some transaminitis, he progressed. So again, looking at the charts. So when he first came in, he received Texa 12 milligram from the low, uh, from CAC with high inflammatory markers. So if we convert this to the usual UD, it will be 267. He received IV methylprednisolone 160 in ED uh, when he was hooked on to the hyphonase cannula. Um, and despite methylprednisolone, his CRP does not seem to budge. So we add on IV, uh, sorry, oral baricitinib 4 milligram. It, Baricitinib also takes about 48 to 72 hours to work. So as we could see, after about 48 hours, the CRP starts to go down. 
um, inflammatory markers uh, that we also monitor is ferritin level here, 1,224. Uh, about 72 hours post baristinic, he was able to win uh, from high flow nasal cannula to high flow mass, followed by stepping down steroids from methylprednisolone to dexamethasone, but still continuing baristinic. So baristinic, uh, we usually use about 7 uh, to 14 days, uh, depending on clinical response and oxygen requirement. These are his uh, radio images. Um, showing uh, vascular angiopathy and mild organizing pneumonia. So we stopped Baris CTD uh, after about five days um, and just maintained him on oral dexamethasone. He was well and discharged under room air um, at day 29, 21 of illness, which is about, um, about nine days after admission and completed 14 days of steroid. So those are the happy stories. Unfortunately, some patients, despite whatever we do, they still progress. So if we look at this case, uh, patient was on dexamethasone and then was escalated to methylprednisolone and baricitinib. But despite receiving uh, dual immunomodulators, uh, including steroids, um, CRP seems to slightly respond, but patient require intubation with negative blood cultures to suggest concomitant infection and low procal. Unfortunately, patient passed away uh, a few days later. So patients, some patients just progress despite whatever that we do. And why this is so? So we did another sort of like mini survey in Sungai Bulo looking at uh, why our patient respond poorly. So when we look at the patient uh, in July, we found that many patients actually came late. So about um, 60%, uh, sorry, 60% uh, uh, came in early, but about 40% came in uh, late. And these late presenter uh, has very poor response to treatment. So um, that's why we advocate patient to come in early so that we can intervene early and hopefully stop the progression. Because as the, if they come in late, uh, already category four or five, it's sometimes very difficult to reverse the uh, lung damage and stop the, the ARDS progression. And um, this is also uh, an up unpublished uh, data that we gathered in Sungai Bulo. Um, those patients who were started varicitinib uh, early when they are only on face mask actually do better compared to those who come in late. So those who come in late means they come in already requiring high flow mass and above. So those who were ventilated with multi-organ failure actually do not respond to baricitinib. And even if we start them, uh, this, the second part is just showing that, uh, the age group uh, uh, when patient presents. So the younger you, your patients are, the more likely they're going to respond. And if we even try to start baristinib in emergency department. So even trying to start the medication at the door, right at the doorstep, um, patients still progress and uh, couldn't make it. So back to this graph. So ideally, if we could catch them at this junction, treating them early with immunomodulators, halting the progression of inflammatory response, which then cause a lot of harm and damage to the lung, which then leads to multi-organ failure. So late presentation, worse outcome. A little bit on COVID-19 uh, in pregnancy. So um, pregnant, uh, pregnant ladies are high risk group because they have lower lung reserve due to gravid uterus. They usually comes in with a lot of metabolic complications such as starvation ketosis or uncontrolled gestational diabetes. Um, in those early year, in early times, many were not vaccinated or fearful of vaccination. So they can rapidly deteriorate. And sometimes many actually fear of, uh, many of uh, physicians fear to perform chest x-ray and that also leads to uh, 
delay in recognition of disease progression. Um, so treatment should be the same as non-pregnant women and we can and should consider use of immunomodulators even uh, because the benefit outweighs the risk. Uh, always discuss with uh, managing obstetrician as well as patient and um, partners uh, to ensure that communication is uh, uh, on the way. And of also, we have to think about the risk of venous thromboembolism in this group um, as they are more likely to develop uh, problems. So steroid use in gestation uh, are usually subdivided into the weeks of pregnancy. So early pregnancy or later pregnancy, we, we try to avoid using dexamethasone as it causes placenta and may lead to more harm to fetus. So talking about complications of VTE, um, this is also a very common reason why patients can suddenly detrate. So using uh, anticoagulation um, increases the probability of survival and reduces the, the need of ventilation. So all patients should be considered um, for the risk of PE and treat with full dose anticoagulation, especially if they have marked rise or increase in D-dimer plus acute worsening of hypoxemia, uh, issues or problems with managing blood pressure and tachycardia, or if there's an explained evidence of right heart strain from ECG, or if any uh, one could uh, perform bedside echocardiogram. Because we not all centers can perform CT pulmonary angiography. So if you suspect PE, please treat them up front. And once the patients are stable, send them down for an imaging or bedside assessment to, to suspect PE if, if you think the patient has one. Unfortunately, COVID-19 pathophysiology doesn't help. Because of the disease, um, many small vessels are affected. So this... Uh, the, the vasculature of a normal uh, lung. And when the patient has COVID-19, especially severe disease, we could see that many small vessels uh, supplying um, the lung are all affected with COVID angiopathy. So that's why you get a lot of uh, issues uh, in terms of managing uh, hypoxia in, in, in patient with COVID. Patient has profound immune paralysis, um, they have altered respiratory defenses with altered pulmonary vessels. They have endothelial dysfunction and microthrombosis. Um, also, the effects of treatment, uh, antibiotics, immunomodulators, drugs, all just contributes to the um, progression of disease. Uh, one more thing about uh, the reason why patient may progress is the decompensation of comorbidities that they come in with. So many patients, uh, especially those with multiple comorbidities, have uncontrolled diabetes or starvation ketosis because of the period of illness, very poor oral intake, especially in elderly, and of course, the use of steroid. So we are equally guilty in contributing to this. Patient may also come in with concomitant bacterial infection. Just to share with you, I think the past two weeks, we have been seeing a lot of strep pneumo, um, bacterial infection and concomitant bacterial pneumonia uh, in patients coming in with COVID-19. Um, cardiovascular complications are also very common. Patients come in with MI, stroke, central venous thrombosis, um, and they also can come in with uh, decompensation of their chronic organ impairments such as acute on CKD, uh, decompensated liver failure, decompensated um, uh, congestive cardiac failure and worsening of in, uh, interstitial lung uh, disease. Um, many with COVID uh, are also very debilitated. Uh, they have prolonged immobility. Uh, some develop deconditioning, um, deep vein thrombosis and pressure ulcers. And um, patients also have uh, a lot of issues in terms of psychiatric and psychological impact. Uh, with worsening uh, anxiety or depression or instability in their underlying schizophrenia or MDD. Uh, many had adjustment disorder, bereavement issues, um, suicidal intention, ideation and delirium. 
uh, one slide on um, severe organizing pneumonia following COVID-19. So once we have dealt with uh, COVID, um, the sequelae of disease needs to be thought of. Um, so unfortunately, this is a very is another huge topic for discussion. Um, so we usually will discuss with a respiratory physician uh, on case to case basis on how to treat severe organizing pneumonia in COVID. But many case reports uh, suggest that it is very seroresponsive and the onset is much, much later. So um, I hope I keep to the time, yes. Um, so take home message for today, identify risk factors and predict possibility of detration in patients with COVID-19. Patients with COVID-19 needs timely treatment. So identify them at their various uh, stage of illness because we can do many things to try to halt the disease progression. There's not much strong evidence using antiviral alone in managing COVID-19, so that's work in progress. Uh, and steroid is still, unfortunately, our main workhorse in curbing CRS because of limited uh, availability of immunomodulators, uh, the, the expensive and not widely available. But please beware of your cumulative steroid use uh, during CRS. Also try to use lower steroid dosing for those with um, patients who are at risk of higher um, uh, of concomitant infection in elderly and patients with uncontrolled diabetes. Don't start steroids too early during viral phase as this may cause more harm. Uh, we advocate using steroid agents, uh, second agents, sorry, in, in, uh, in, in, together with uh, steroids to control CRS and always, always consider PE uh, as the cause of your patient's deterioration. Thank you. So thank you very much, uh, Ariza, for that excellent, excellent, uh, comprehensive and very clear review of um, the updates on how to manage uh, patients with COVID-19 from, uh, you know, the moderately severe to severe disease. Um, you know, uh, it's uh, been 18 months, 19 months, and and. We have learned a lot and, uh, you know, in terms of how to optimize uh, management um, on a background of ever-changing guidelines. Um, and so you've done a fantastic job of summarizing uh, the clinical trials and also highlighting um, the extensive experience that you all have had. Now, we have uh, a number of questions um, in the chat group. Uh, if you don't mind me asking the first one, um, everybody's shy. They don't want to put their name uh, in the chat. Um, the first question is, what's the option if a patient um, has contraindication for corticosteroids such as upper GI bleed? Um, is it possible to use tocilizumab or baricitinib alone without a combination of steroids? Okay, uh, thank you for the first question. Um, well, baricitinib is also an oral agent. So if the patient is contraindicated for um, steroids, uh, for example, upper GI bleed, they are usually nil by mouth and hence you may not be able to serve your baricitinib. So in this situation, sometimes we use IV tocilizumab if they are indicated. However, um, fortunately, in some centers uh, such as Sungai Bulo, we can actually uh, do uh, bedside OGDS quite quickly and uh, exclude or try to halt the GI bleeding and hence able to resume the treatment that they should receive. So if the patient are contraindicated for steroids, um, uh, being in IV form even, uh, we try to reduce uh, the need of steroid by cutting down to sometimes IV hydrocortisone or in some papers actually advocate using IV remdesivir together with uh, baricitinib uh, if the patient can take orally. Um, so these are your alternatives if steroid is contraindicated. Um, uh, try to get help from your uh, friendly surgeons and see if they could scope the patient uh, because sometimes we, we try 
to not optimize patients' medication just because they have some coffee ground. But if they are not um, hemodynamically unstable, we try to continue because salvaging the lung is at most important in, uh, in COVID management. Okay, Arisa, there's lots of questions on um, steroids. Uh, I might just bunch them together. So would you advocate um, to use IV DEXA 12 milligrams BD um, or, um, and when do you use hydrocortisone versus DEXA? Okay, so um, as I mentioned in, uh, in, in my talk earlier, we, um, we have moved away from using high dose steroids. Um, so back in 2020, uh, when we do not have anything else but steroid and not much evidence, including um, um, recovery trial wasn't out at that time, we used IV DEXA BD. Um, DEXA is actually a long acting drug. So OD dosing is enough and uh, we advocate using the lowest steroid possible being 8 milligram uh, OD or 12 milligram OD. Um, if you need to use uh, to step up your steroid and you do not have IV methylprednisolone, you can use dexamethasone equivalent dose to your methylprednisolone. Talk to a pharmacist for... Uh, to, to dose your medication, uh, but um, in this case, uh, we try not to use uh, steroid alone for management of CRS. We combine them with uh, alternative uh, immunomodulators such as Bari or Tosi, uh, so that we can use some sort of steroid sparing agent and prevent complications from steroid. In terms of hydrocortisone and dexamethasone, so steroid actually works together as a class effect. So you can use hydrocortisone, dexamethasone or methylprednisolone interchangeably depending on the availability. At one point, I know um, um, Keda ran out of methylprednisolone. So they had to use a lot of hydrocortisone and dexamethasone. Um, those equal uh, equivalent dose conversions. So it is okay to use, but as I say, try to uh, minimize your steroid use to the lowest dose possible. Okay, great. Um, moving away from steroid, um, let's take this question on, um, or maybe one more question on steroid. If the patient's CRP is more than 50 and doubling, but still able to maintain oxygen saturation, what's the recommendation on steroid if other causes of raised CRP have been excluded? Okay, interesting uh, findings that we have found of late when we receive a lot of vaccinated patients. So patient who has been vaccinated, um, this is not published data yet, we're still trying to, to gather evidence. We found that patients who are vaccinated, they come in with higher CRP, um, but low oxygen requirement. So do not just use CRP to make a, uh, uh, to guide on your treatment. So use three markers. One is physical examination. So your oxygen requirement. Number two is your biomarkers, uh, either CRP, ferritin, uh, LDH, uh, and white cell count. And number three is radiological uh, evidence uh, of uh, ground glass infiltrates. So if it's just CRP that is worrying you, closely monitor the patient and keep to the lowest steroid or not even steroids if the patient do not require oxygen. Thank you, that's, that's great advice. Okay. Um, sorry, there's lots and lots of questions on steroids. So another one, how do you decide when to step down from IV to oral? Okay, so uh, as soon as your patient is able to tolerate orally, switch them to oral because IV and oral bioavailability is the same. Um, unless there's contraindication to oral uh, or you you worry about uh, aspiration in patient with, uh, with altered mentation, yes, you IV, but as soon as the patient is improving, so give them about 48 to 72 hours. If they are improving with stable oxygen requirement, ability to take orally without GI losses, convert them to oral medication. 
Okay. Maybe this one, uh, two more questions on steroids. Sorry, we, we can't seem to run away from it. Uh, one is, I noticed that some of your patients came in within two days uh, and yet received DEXA. Isn't it risky to start DEXA during the viral replication phase? Okay, so um, it depends on uh, patient history and uh, the blood investigation. Quite similar to dengue, some patients say they come in at day one or day two of worsening symptoms, but they may be incubating or having the viral phase at home. So many patients nowadays, they don't come in early to hospital. They either stay at home or being admitted to low risk centers such as MAIPS. So we in the hospital setting rarely see patients coming in at, at day two or day three of illness. So those patients who has evidence of early disease being having lowish white cell, lymphopenia uh, and um, uh, symptoms suggestive of uh, early viral disease, uh, we do not give them steroids because it may cause more harm. And uh, yeah, this is a, a used to be a popular question. I think you've kind of answered it, but let's let's take it anyway. Is there any role of methylpred in treating organizing pneumonia in patients who seem to be deteriorating and requiring higher oxygen requirement? Okay, so. Uh, we thought that we were hoping that steroid is the answer for all. Okay, unfortunately, it is not. Um, we were very trigger happy to give a lot of steroids, thinking that we, they will get better. Um, those with OP, so we really have to be really careful when we wanted to label someone as OP, uh, called, uh COVID OP. So one needs to have a CT evidence suggestive of organizing pneumonia. So they could also have changes in the CT scan that is actually uh, uh, showing that it is ARDS rather than COVID organizing pneumonia. So in ARDS, giving more steroid is harmful. Number two, if the deterioration, so meaning the, the need of increasing oxygen requirement is because of a concomitant nosocomial pneumonia that they acquire whilst being admitted, um, giving methylprednisolone will not do justice to the patient. Okay, so one, please make sure that the diagnosis of COVID organizing pneumonia is um, correctly made and consult with respiratory physicians to confirm it. Number two, we actually did um, uh, look at our uh, internal data of uh, trying to use methylprednisolone in OP and we found that many patients actually did not respond to steroid. Um, uh, only about 10% respond to steroid, but those patients were probably uh, early presenters. So they improve with or without steroids more likely. So those who come in late, as I mentioned earlier, late uh, presenter worse outcome despite whatever that we do um, so trying to limit the steroid use uh, try to use a uh, steroid alternative uh, and cut short on your duration of steroid if uh, if you're able to yeah thank you very much Arisa on this um, as you know um, there was a lot of confusion and and probably over uh, diagnosis of organizing pneumonia on uh, CT scan um, and, and clinically as well that led to massive overuse of uh, methylpred, which, you know, kind of distressed uh, some of us <laughs> uh, several months ago. Um, I think you, you very clearly stated that the changes uh, seen on CT scan are, are actually, we, we don't do post-mortem, but in, in other countries that have done post-mortem, it actually correlates to diffuse alveolar damage more than the classical organizing pneumonia that um, occur in, in other disease or in, in boobs and, and you know, uh, idiopathic organizing pneumonia. So um, we really need to almost retrain ourselves to not call this organizing pneumonia, but well, in actual fact, it's, um, it's diffuse alveolar damage. Um, and ARDS, uh, and like you rightly said, um, steroid might, may actually be um, actually detrimental. So thank you for, for clarifying that um, 
so clearly. Okay, maybe we can move away from steroids. We've only got one more minute. Um, uh, what about rebound um, cytokine response syndrome? How long should we anticipate uh, that a patient may have a risk of developing a rebound uh, CRS? Okay, so um, when we closely monitor CRP, uh, sometimes slight increase in your inflammatory markers make you uh, feel a little bit agitated, especially if your patient is uh, deteriorating right in front of your eyes. Okay, so when we wanted to step down in terms of steroid, or for example, switching from IV to oral, we need to make sure that whatever intervention that we do, the patient is actually taking the medicine. So let's say if we, we switch from IV DEXA to oral DEXA, and we notice that the CRP trend actually goes up and along with deteriorating in oxygen requirement, then you may need to consider putting the patient back on IV. So maybe the absorption of DEXA wasn't really good or patient were not able to take the oral DEXA at all. We also see some, uh, some patients rebound uh, when we stop the uh, second immunomodulator. For example, if we use uh, five days worth of baricitinib um, and if we stop the baricitinib a bit too early, so because the recommended baricitinib duration is about 10 to 14 days based on the papers, um, uh, or, or study papers uh, for baricitinib. But because of cost issue and quota issue, we try to cut short on, on the duration of baricitinib. So please be careful and do not cut down too fast or cut down too many drugs at the same time especially within the first two weeks of illness, because at that time they were still uh, probably in the CRS phase. So uh, rough guide, less than 14 days, be careful. Um, don't switch off or cut down on medications too, uh, uh, too, many, uh, too many medications at the same time. Uh, and also, if your CRP press, uh, rebound, look hard for infection. Look at... Uh, uh, we were caught many times people chasing CRP, but it's actually secondary bacterial infection from a thrombophilbitis. So please look at your lines, um, look out for you know worsening diabetic foot ulcer infection, things that might be hiding in your patient and contribute to the, to the rise CRP rather than because of a rebound CRS. Okay, we're two minutes past four, but I'll just take one last question from, from the attendees. How long will you repeat the COVID, or when will you repeat, I should say, the COVID-19 swap in patients coming in for respiratory symptoms after previous history of COVID-19? Okay, so um, one, we need to look at what is the current presentation, okay? So if it is a new onset of respiratory complaints, um, we need to think again whether the first diagnosis of COVID was right. Um, we had a few patients who claimed to have COVID-19, was home quarantined or admitted in, in uh, low risk centers, but they do not have evidence of positive results, uh, even look when we look at SIMCA. So they might be getting COVID from um, the Lori centers or, or when they are quarantining together with their family members. So please think again whether the first diagnosis of COVID is right. So if that is the case, then you there will be a benefit of uh, doing a COVID PCR to confirm your diagnosis. If you have the first PCR result, uh, try to trace the CT value and you can compare your repeated swaps to the CT value of your previous swaps. So if in doubt, you can repeat the PCR, but please uh, bear in mind that CT values, although it is, uh, it is a value, you have to interpret it together with the uh, clinical presentation. So we do not recommend repeating swap unless you are doubting the diagnosis of or COVID or we're thinking of COVID reinfection. Okay, I think um, we're a little over time. So thank you very, very much, Arisa, and uh, to all the 172 participants minus Arisa, 171 participants minus Arisa, Mina and myself for joining us and, and 
staying on this afternoon. I'm sure you all agree that was super excellent. Um, I just want to quote what Datu Dr. Baba said in the chat group here. Congratulations, Arisa, for your excellent lecture. It was a very clear update with sharing of Singapore experience. You have successfully kept it simple. Bravo. I have enjoyed listening to you. And so have I, and I'm sure all um, our other colleagues, 171 of them. <laughs> um, thank you very much for, uh, you know, as I said, a very comprehensive and um, clear lecture. And uh, hopefully um, those listening will have gain much much uh, knowledge and um, we'll, we'll use that in managing um, you know future inshallah not too many uh, patients uh, that we have to deal with you apart from uh, giving an excellent lecture of course you have um, battled uh, COVID for the last two years almost um, I think all of you deserve a rest uh, I hope you all are taking turns to have some holidays um, and uh, you know uh, and, and and let the vaccine do the work um, yep. and uh, see us opening up again and kind of going back to some form of normalcy although it probably won't be completely normal so thank you yes. to the College of Physicians Malaysia for organizing this and to Dr. Mina and, and all of you for joining thank you thank you very much well, thank you, Dr. Arisa. So, um, to all the participants, thank you very much. Next week, we will talk about role of lung ultrasound in COVID. So, we have um, invited um, someone who's very experienced. And it will be practical session, as in uh, basics. Please do join. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Bye. This